Welcome to the second in our uh, summer series focusing on transition to adulthood. Um, I think we've got a little competition with Donald Trump this evening, so I think you guys are in the right place, personally. Um, so we're very happy to have uh, Teresa and Ben. I'm going to let them uh, talk a little bit about themselves and the work that they do um, and this, um, you know, focusing on the transition to adulthood uh, this evening. Thanks. And Teresa's coming up first. Thanks, Jim. Um, so my name's Therese Fafizadeh. Um, I spoke last year at the Autism 200, so hopefully I'm not going to repeat myself too much. Um, I, I am a nurse practitioner at the Autism Center, and in one minute I will find the... Um, and for those of you who aren't familiar with what the nurse practitioners do, we do some of the initial assessments, um, some diagnostic workups, and also management of kids and adults with, or kids and teens with autism. I'm also the executive director of Tavon Center. It's a day program that my husband and I started. Um, the program actually opened in 2008, and it serves people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and about a little over half of the 65 people that we serve have autism. Um, I'm also a mother of Saba. This is her on the horse here. She just started horseback riding again. And she was born with a developmental disability and she's really the reason why I have gone down the path that I've gone in my life. And I like to think that I would be, have been a good person without her, but she's definitely made me a much better person and I think a much better provider as well. So today um, we're talking about resources and connecting to resources in the community. And so I am gonna talk about resources, but I think what also is important to know is some of the challenges that go along with connecting with resources as parents. Um, our kids grow up in the, the public school system and are really for the most part well taken care of and they've got things to do and they're learning and they've got socialization and that's wonderful and then when they reach 21 and, and leave their um, their transition program it's really tough as a parent to realize that you are going to have to remain their social director um, and that there's nobody out there quite like the school that you get to you know, hand them off to in the morning and have them come home in the afternoon and know that they have a really good day. Um, it, it is daunting to try to put together the adult world. I will say, it's about 33 now, so we've been doing this for a while. I'll say there's more options out there, so that's a really great thing to look forward to. Um, I, there's a big push on employment, which is wonderful. Um, I think there also needs to be the option of some other um, programs, recreational, social, um, just because employment doesn't always fill the day for some people who have higher needs. Um, so piecing that together as a parent can be challenging and knowing that you're always going to have to kind of be on point. Um, so when I was thinking about what were some of the barriers of the families that not, not only the ones that I see at the Autism Center, but also looking back to when we were going through the transition process. I think um, as much as we as providers try to stress start early, um, parents don't realize that early means you, you really need to be looking at things by the time they turn 16, your child turns 16. Uh, you need to have a good idea of what path they're going down. Are they going to a two-year or four-year program in a college? Are they going to go into the transition program in the high school? Are they going to need lifelong support and go have supported employment their whole life and maybe a day program to go along with it? So, so my, my belief is by about age 16, you have a pretty good idea of which path somebody's going to go down. So I, I think recognizing that and taking advantage of all the, that the school has to offer, getting those transition goals into the IEP are really crucial. Um, one of the other barriers is lack of preparation by the transition program. So if your son or daughter does go into a transition program, 
ideally what they'll do is be taught the skills that they will need to either live independently or as independently as possible, ideally have a job. Um, by the time they graduate, that's a pie in the sky. I see faces being made in the audience. But, <laughs> but, but that's, I mean, if we're talking about ideal and then we can talk about real um, is a whole different thing. Um, but, but it's something to shoot for. I think we, we just have to really keep pushing forward as parents because that's how we're, we're going to change things. And as exhausting as it is, um, it, it's important that our transition programs are preparing our sons and daughters to, to go out into the world and be the best that they can be. The other huge issue that probably everybody who has a son or daughter trying to get ready to go into the work world is lack of employment. Um, there just aren't enough jobs out there um, for people who have disabilities of any sort. And I know I'm talking to a group of parents whose kids probably have varying um, levels of function. And, um, but for, for anybody, it's, it's really tough to find that job and not only find it, but then be able to maintain it. And there's lots of reasons why people lose jobs. They, they weren't taught the right social skills. They don't have the right... Um, adaptations in the work setting. Sometimes people lose a job because access is late all the time and gets them, gets them to the, their job too late. Um, this is just some, some information from DDA. Um, it's, it's two years old now, but it was the, the most recent data that I could find. Um, basically, when you look at the numbers about the, the number of people who are leaving the transition program each year, and this is in King County, and the number served by the school to work program, and then it just goes down, the, and then the number who actually become employed by school to work, and employed can be an hour a week, so it's not full-time employment or even part-time employment. So, th so there's a lot of young adults still out there who, who need something other than an employment option, um, and staying home with mom and dad because that's you know it's just not developmentally what people should be doing in their early 20s it's it, they should be out in the world learning new things and you know socializing with their their peers um lack of transportation can be another issue so if your son or daughter is eligible for access um the transition programs are usually fairly good about helping people apply for that. It's, it's a bigger deal now than it used to be having to have an evaluation and um, access is an imperfect system, but it's the system that we have and we're, we're lucky to have that and people learn more or less how to navigate it. Um, other barriers of getting people out into the community and connecting with community is a lack of day programs. There's a, just a handful of day programs out there that serve young adults with disabilities specifically um, and fewer that will schedule in blocks of time that allow parents to be able to keep a job. Um, parks departments are out there, um, but they are, you know, every 12 weeks you sign back up again. So. Um, and, and a lack of understanding that for some people, uh, whether you have a disability or not, so full-time employment isn't necessarily quality of life. My, my daughter is, you know, her, her happiest days are when she's with her friends. Does she care if she makes $5 or $5 million? Not really. Um, if she had a job that was meaningful, she, that, that would be great. Um, she has some volunteer opportunities right now, which are wonderful because they connect her out in the community. And um, I believe very strongly that, that everybody should be integrated into the community in a way that is best for them. Uh-oh. Um, so start, starting early is probably one of the best strategies that you as parents could have. Oh, I have to apologize about the slides. I, I am really bad about looking back at my presentation the, the day or two before and changing things. So at the very end of this presentation, I've got my email address. And if you want the real slides, I'm happy to send them to you. Um, so sorry about that. I meant to mention that at the very beginning. So starting early, um, 16 is, is when transition goals should be put into um, the IEP. And the transition goals are what help connect people to the resources, whether it's the disabilities 
um, counselor at the college um, or getting into supported employment or getting into day programs. It, ju it just helps guide people down a path. Um, and then figure out what the path is for your son or daughter and help guide them into appropriate programs. If, if a four-year college is not going to be best for them because they haven't learned all the adaptive skills, maybe look at a two-year college first and, and go from there. Um, if, if work isn't going to be the, the right way to go, then, then look at, at doing community access. Um, so there, there's lots of ways, but it's just starting to think as a parent, what, what is connection to the community going to look like for my son or daughter when they leave the high school? Um, setting. Um, look at the various programs that are out there. Um, find out what the admission criteria is. Talk with your son or daughter about it. If they're going to be helping make the choice of where they're headed, I think that that will be, that, that, that's really important that they're on the same pa path as you too. Um, other things you can do is consider summertime um, employment or volunteerism, um, internships, opportunities. Our, our day program, we, we have people who come during the summer months and then go back to their transition program. So it, at the end when they graduated, when we had space in our program, um, they were able to transition really nicely into our program, and that that was very beneficial. Volunteer opportunities also are great on a resume for somebody who's going to work, whether it's with su uh, support or not. Um, and it also helps in the you as a parent and the the son or daughter realize what are they good at, what and what are they interested in. Looking out there at all the different programs, if you're looking for day programs, getting on wait lists early, um, if programs fill up pr pretty quickly. Um, college kinds of things, I don't really know about the kind of, if they have long wait lists or what their criteria are for that. Um, some of the resources, when you start thinking about what it is and how do I do it, um, the teachers of the programs that your sons or daughters are in, if they're in the transition program, use them and talk to the, the teachers and talk, ask them what other parents have done. Where have other graduates gone? What are they doing? Where, where are they employed? Or where are they getting their day services? Um, talking to counselors, whether it's counselors at school or whether you use private counselors, um, again, and using counselors to think about strengths and challenges and what might be a good fit and how an environment not, might need to be adaptive. Same thing with psychologists. If you have a, a school psychologist you can use that you feel comfortable with. Um, find other parents of teens who have transitioned and, and talk to them. Groups like this are great. Um, the ARC has a, a listserv for transitioning to adulthood um, that has a lot of chatter back and forth from people who are both transitioning and have transitioned. Um, at the Autism Center, we have the Next Steps classes, and these are, they're three 90-minute classes, and each class goes over a specific curric curriculum related to um, transitioning to adulthood. So they talk about you know, DDA and um, DVR and guardianship and waivers. Um, and and th they'll also talk about um, day programs and housing and things like that as well. So they're, they're really helpful and really great. It's usually a small group of parents, maybe six or eight. So it, you get, get lots of times to ask questions. They have people who are knowledgeable about um, transitioning um, and what needs to be done to have everything um, in place. There's two tracks for those classes. One is steps to independence for people who would be headed off to post-secondary education and the other is lifelong learner for people who will need support throughout their life. We also, yeah, go ahead. Um, so the next steps mm -hmm. program that you're talking about, which sounds great, uh -huh. um, at the Autism Center, Seattle Children's Autism Center. Great, thank you. Uh -huh. um, also, um, for some people who it's not clear where they're headed, we do have transition assessments at the Autism Center. 
um, people will, can come and either see one of the nurse practitioners, and if we feel like somebody would benefit from seeing one of our psychologists and having some additional testing that might help guide a person in knowing what kind of supports they need um, to be successful, um, it can be, uh, it, it works really well, especially for people who haven't had a recent assessment through the school district. Um, if, you, if your son or daughter is enrolled in DDA, you, using your caseworker as a, a resource can be helpful too. Question. Uh-huh. What's the cost? What's the cost for? Oh, that's something I don't know. But you could call the Autism Center and, and find out. Um, do you have a question? Can you define DDA? Can I define DDA? Oh, it's the, um, they, ch they just changed their name from DDD, the De Developmental Disabilities Administration. And so it was originally a state-funded group that served people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. They're now serving more people with autism who are more um, borderline, uh, so people who would um, not necessarily qualify for your DDA services under their old guidelines, but now they do. They have some requirements, and IQ has to be under 85, and, and adaptive skills have to be low um, on the Vineland, or the ABAS, I believe they use. Um, so it's a state agency, um, and if you go online, you can read about how you apply for it and kind of the criteria. And there, there are services, so if you qualify for DDA, the services can, people can qualify for respite services, they can qualify for Medicaid personal care. It, it just depends on your need. They come to your home and do a, a whole assessment on you. Um, so I'm... I'm not a 100% expert in DDA, but that's what it stands for, and those are some of the basic things that they do. Yes? And, you know, just to let you know, I want to repeat this to everybody else. You yes. A, um, someone come from DDA in May and went over everything, um, all the sort of programs that were offered through DDA, um, and that's on our autism, uh, autism 200 like YouTube page, so you can go back and watch that at a later time. Okay, so what, what Jim just said is that there was somebody from DDA here a, a couple of months ago, and if you go on YouTube, the Autism 200 YouTube series, you can read all about what DDA has to offer. So um, okay, so, so the person from DDA is presenting all their programs. Much better resource than me. <laughs> um, so... Uh, it's, it's exciting that there's lots of different programs out there now through the community colleges. The, these are all certainly relatively new since my daughter graduated. Um, Bellevue College has two programs, the Navigators Program, which is for people who are higher functioning, I would, um, for lack of a better term, and the OLS Program, the Occupational Life Skills Program, which serves um, people who have higher needs. Um, the Highline Community College has the ACHIEVE program and they serve people with higher needs too. I, uh, the criteria for entrance into all of these programs, it, it, it's best if you just go on and, and read about the criteria. Um, some of them have very specific criteria surrounding IQ and adaptive skills. Um, so that's, you know, it's, it's best, but it, it's just nice to know that they're out there and options for, for some people. Um, and so the sales program at Seattle Central, um, Shoreline has the Community College Integration Program, and then there's the Do It program at the University of Washington. University of Washington just started a new peer mentor program through their speech and hearing department, which is exciting as well. Um, and then if your son or daughter is headed to a, a community college, using the disabilities counselor there is really important. They usually let parents come into the first visit, and after that you're kind of on your, the child is on their own, which is really hard for some people. <laughs>
There are uh, day programs out there um, that uh, support various people and, ha and look different. So the Tavon Center, that's the program I started, we're, we serve people with, with all sorts of needs, um, from people who are, require toileting and feeding to people who can, um, can go volunteer at Swedish hospitals. So we, we have several off-site volunteer places. Um, we're on six acres and we're centered around farming and horticulture. Um, and we <coughs> schedule in four hour blocks, excuse me, <coughs> from nine to one or one to five. Once somebody's in the program, they're in the program. We don't make people re-enroll. And so I think what makes it attractive to families is that once their son or daughter's in, they have a consistent schedule that they know about. Um, Alyssa Burnett Center, that's part of Children's Hospital, is great. They have lots of different classes um, that, that cover a range of needs. They have life skills classes, they have art classes, they have um, lots of different kinds of events, and you can go on the children's um, child website and see what classes, their curriculum changes every quarter. They follow the college um, quarter system, so it does require re-enrolling re every quarter for classes. Um, but you can take, the person could take as many or as few classes as they want. I think the, their classes are usually about 90 minutes, um, and they serve a, a variety of people as well. Um, Aaron's Place is another day program out there that serves people with high needs. They've got four or five sites. They've got one in Seattle, kind of by Blanchett High School, one in Kirkland, one in Bothell, two, three, and, and I th believe they have one in Linwood as well. Um, all of these places, and, oh, Bridge of Promise, their incarnation, and they're another day program that's scheduled similar to Tavon Center. Um, they, they all take um, Medicaid personal care or respite dollars or private pay. Redmond Hub is run by the Redmond Parks Department. It's for people who, people need to be able to, to feed and toilet themselves to go there. They can't come with a, an aid. Um, and then the Parks Department of every city has lots of specialized recreation programs too. So um, just seeing what's out there is, you know, the, at, at least there's some opportunities. I know. I know it seems really limited and is really hard, but from where we came from, you know, 12 years ago to now, there's there is more opportunity. I wish there was more, um, but that that comes with time and persistence from parents. Uh, just a minute. Yes. These are places to work, or these are these are so these are day centers. Yes. Oh. The question was, these are places to work or are they educational? Um, so at, at our program, our goal is to continue to teach people life skills and ideally get them to be as independent as possible. So we, we are set up like a, a farm. We have a house, we have a farm, and people are, are required, not required. I mean, part of the program is learning to do chores. Lunch is part of the program, so people learn how to cook. We have, uh, have to do menu planning, so somebody's involved with menu planning and then grocery shopping. So, so it's teaching life skills in a naturalistic setting. Um, we're not a true vocational program, um, but it was important to me to create a program that had meaning and not where people were sitting around doing arts and crafts. So we do do arts and crafts. Um, ours, you know, some of our, our arts and crafts projects are they make lip balm from the calendula that they grow in the garden and then they sell it at the farmer's market. We have a market stand. I, there were pictures, I believe, of our, that says our market stand. So the produce that people grow, um, we sell at the market. So it's community integration, it's um, you know, learning to interact in the public, it's, um, so that, that's our program. Uh, the, some of the other ones, like the Alyssa Burnett Center, they teach a lot of different things. It's not, it's not employment, it's they'll teach uh, life skills that will help somebody prepare for employment, but they don't provide employment and they're not like a vocational or an employment vendor. 
Um, same with, with like Redmond Hubs and the Parks Department are your basic Parks Department classes. If you think about what a Parks Department class looks like, that's what they look like. Yes. Uh -huh. So the question was, um, do I know if any of these places will have room for people who have behavioral challenges, somebody who's not necessarily a danger to themselves or other, but, but gets really upset? By the nature of the people that we work with, um, yes, we have people who have behavior problems. When they get tough, we have people, we've had a behavior specialist come in and do a functional behavioral assessment and teach the staff um, how to implement that plan. Our staff are not behavior specialists, um, but they certainly are, can learn how to implement a behavior plan and have been really successful. Um, so the criteria for most of these places is they will take people who have behavior as long as they're not a danger to themselves or others. Um, and so I know the Burnett Center does have BCBAs on staff, and so they deal probably with maybe higher behavior needs than, than we do. Um, Bridge of Promise, maybe the same thing. I know Aaron's Place has dealt with people who have behavior problems as well. So it's, and all, most places are willing to give it a try and see, see how it goes, yeah, because, and not every program is gonna fit every person. What, what looks great and beautiful for one person might not be the best fit for somebody else. Um, so, you're welcome. So the, looking at vocational resources, um, our state is a work first state, so they really would like everybody who graduates from high school to have a job or be on the pathway to employment. Um, so the, there is the school to work program in King County that um, if your son or daughter is in the transition program, they sh ideally will be part of the school to work program. And their goal is to have people employed by the time they get out of, of the um, transition program. Sometimes it's a volunteer position, um, but the goal is paid employment at at, at least minimum wage. Um, the transition programs, many of them have employment specialists, so working with them to try to identify what are, are the strengths of your, your child and what are their challenges, what will be a really great environment for them and, and what would be a more challenging environment. And if they're interested in something but you're not quite sure if it's going to work, are there, are there adaptations you can put in place in that environment to make them be successful? Um, the supported employment agencies are also great resources. Um, they, they will come into play when people leave the school to work program. Um, again, it's, it's, you know, the, there just aren't a ton of jobs out there. Um, and sometimes when you get an employment vendor, it's not a good fit for you, your family, or your child. And so it's okay to change. You can, you can go to a different employment vendor. Um, we've thought long and hard at the Autism Center about keeping a list of pros and cons of all the different employment vendors out there, but, but it oftentimes varies even from job coach to job coach. Yes? Um, I work for Northwest Center. Uh-huh. And um, so She is a job coach. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. They go out and talk to them and try to adapt. Um, and we actually do try to link up with what clients would prefer and what their skills are. So, you know, we had a client that just got a job at Ace Hardware, and we had never had a relationship with them before, but the job developer went in and found that there was a job the client could do with just counting something. Yeah. <laughs> now you're on the spot. Oh, I don't want to repeat all that. Yeah, that, I, I, I lost it. <laughs> anyway, yeah, anyway, um, so we have job developers that do try to fit a job with the client, and, fit, and we will develop something that we don't already have. 
Right, and that is really wonderful. Um, and, and I think a really great job developer goes is that person who goes out um, and talks with, with businesses out there and makes them comfortable taking our sons and daughters in for employment and taking what they might consider a, a risk um, because it can be very successful. And so it's wonderful that, that Northwest Center does that. I really enjoy my job, and yeah, and uh, it's great to see so many people working and being a part of the community, like you were saying, and you know, just enjoying doing your, their jobs, and you know, I, it's, it's it's a great thing to be a part of. Absolutely, and it, it gives people meaning and a feeling of purpose. Yeah. The arts and crafts are. We have an oven mitt from that I bought in 1990, 1984 at Pike's Place Market, and we still use it. So uh, I knew it was bought from, from disabled people, but that can't be, that is a, another way of them uh, making money and having a job. Absolutely. So. Um, but unfortunately, uh, our, our state wants people to be out in the community working and you have to be really careful about having too many people with disabilities working together in a what, what might be perceived as a sheltered workshop um, so it, it's a fine line to walk and I think that um, there's there's a balance I think there has to be a balance um, and it's sort of a continuum of services where you know at a, at a day program people making these things that are really great and they feel wonderful about making them um, and, and selling them um, is is not, in my mind, kind of sheltered workshop work. Um, but it is something that, that our state's pretty, they're touchy about. They, they want people to be out and have the opportunity to be out in the community and working. Um, wellness resources, wellness can mean a lot of different things from physical and mental health to, um, to being social and um, so I think one of the, the hard things from a medical point of view is, is transferring from the pediatric health care system to the adult health care system. Um, there's not a list of primary care doctors who are comfortable caring for people with disabilities and so it's it can be really challenging and scary to leave the pediatric system. Um, asking your current provider, your child's current provider, if they have any recommendations where they've referred their other people who have transitioned out before. Checking with other parents who, whose children are a, a bit older than yours and seeing if they have any good recommendations. Um, ask your own medical provider if, they, if they're somebody who know your family and are familiar with your son or daughter. Um, that's that's always a, a great way to try to find a resource for medical care. Um, for mental health, usually in your community health organizations, your behavioral health organizations, um, for, for mental health kinds of things. Um, there is the Autism Center over at the University of Washington right now, though I think they're not taking any new patients at the moment. Well, they go th through some transitions. Um, being able to have recreation to keep yourself healthy and happy. You know, all kinds of studies show that physical exercise helps to decrease depression and anxiety. Um, so look at that, Ben, aspiring youth has, <laughs> Ben will be talking about that program. Um, TRIPS Incorporated is a group that um, has TRIPS for people with disabilities and they provide all the chaperoning and go to a lot of cool places. Um, Friendship Adventures is another one in our area that does more local kinds of things. Um, Outdoors for All uh, who, they have been around forever. They do things all year round. They used to be Ski for All and now because they do things all year round. Um, and they're, they're a great group. And then there's Special Olympics as well. Um, there's various handouts, and I think one of the, the best ones out there for, for transition and trying to, to figure out all that needs to happen is the Are You Ready handout. That's, if, and if you go to the ARC of King County's website, it's on their website. It's a great handout and just really um, 
lays out nicely all the things you should have in, in place as your son or daughter is transitioning and what resources are out there in the community. Um, out on the table, um, there was the Preparing for Transition handout that's put out by um, the Autism Center. On the front of that, you'll see a whole list of handouts that we have available. Um, I didn't print them all out because it's just too, too many and they, they wouldn't be applicable to everyone. Um, but they're there and you're, you're welcome to contact me if you want it. And, and I would just uh, add that if anybody's at our other sites and are interested in um, getting copies of this handout, you can um, have the, the site coordinator email me, Jim Mancini, okay. and I can uh, send you a PDF. Great, thanks. Um, here's my contact information. I have a re really long name, so sorry about that. Um, but feel free to email me if you have questions, concerns, um, ideas, thoughts, great resources that I don't know about that I might want to know about. Um, and we will do questions at the end after Ben speaks. Okay, thank you very much. Parents of high schoolers? Great. Parents of young adults? Parents of older adults? Great. Um, providers or people who work in the field? Awesome miss middle school gymnasts? You know? Yeah. Cool. <laughs> Just going to wait for the slides. So. You can tell us a little bit about who you are. That might be something. Okay. <laughs> I'll just wait until the slides are up. All right. All right. It's going to be another minute or two. I'm just going to. So I'll just survey more before I get started. Um, would you say that wellness is the most important for your high school or young adult, or job, or education, something else? Dating, relationships, what, what's a biggie? I'm kind of. Okay. There was no program out there for high-functioning Asperger's gotcha. gray area kids. Okay. So sort of social stuff. And yeah. that's what you think about for your good. And others? So I'm hearing social or? Yes. Some place to be. Uh-huh. So kind of community integration, being busy, having a, a robust schedule. Oh, yeah. Great. And learning to become an adult. Cool. Others? I'm just kind of, so helpful to kind of hear from folks. And um, so we, then it's a combination of um, social issues and mental health and unfortunately substance abuse. OK. And we're having a lot of trouble getting him into, um, into Harvard because we don't have the right insurance. So. Okay. So for you, it's like intervention and sort of um, intervention, crisis, crisis yeah. intervention. And I think it, I appreciate you bringing that up because I think in this field there's sort of this um, maybe misconception that su substance abuse isn't a factor. That's sort of like disability substance. It does occur. It does occur. Okay. So I'm hearing kind of mental health and, and sort of intervention support. Mm -hmm. cool. um, other areas? Yeah. Uh huh. So pathway to, okay, uh huh, cool. Okay. So we're kind of the range, right? It all kind of fits together, and um, I'm going to continue in terms of some of the things Therese talked about as well. So are we? Slide? I think uh, we're just waiting on the display. Okay. So Ralph's fixing it right now. He's just giving me some. Gotcha. Hand signals. That was another one. Here it comes. All right. I got a comment. Uh, there was a young boy named Braille. Last name was Braille. And he was working in his dad's shop. And he knocked 
something into his eye, and he got an infection in his eye, and then, then he, uh, he got an infection in the other eye and he went blind. And uh, he produced what we call braille. Right, okay. So he, he took his disability and he, right. he produced something mm -hmm. that has changed the world. Right. And so, so, so some, of, some, of the, some of the things, we, we, uh, some of these people, some of, the, some of our kids might be uh, doing something extremely, Yeah, and and we might miss it because we're kind of focused on the norm, or we might, we might yeah, not, yeah. You know, we can hope. Right. When are you speaking to kind of the aspirational nature of a sort of like maybe it shouldn't just be about kind of low expectations? Like, why aren't we kind of what what can how can the world no, change through these folks? I'm and, just making a random comment. Oh, okay. I was I was trying to glean more from your random comment. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And that may be or may not a realistic goal, but um, I think that's I think that's sad if we're underselling right. the talents that might be there, even if they're buried under a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're we're in a we're in a place that is autistic friendly for employment too, than, than, than other places in America. So okay, good. And and that, does that mean that other places in America are well, what's interesting, now I do have to say, my program director in Portland, I was, I was kind of coming at it from that angle, and she was from Indiana, and she said, uh-uh, there's like such more like community. I was doing a, kind of a little bit of a left coast, like, oh, we're, we're enlightened here, stuff like that. She's like, no, in her small town in Indiana, there's a possibility for a little more acceptance, I guess she was saying. So she sort of turned it on the head a little. She's like, Portland and Seattle don't have it all dialed in. Well, I think just in terms of like how folks are accepted in the community, stuff like that, and um, you know, and you do have these big companies saying we want to hire more people with autism. I did an interesting thing. I talked to someone who worked at Microsoft, one of our program parents, and I said, "So tell me about this autism listserv, right?" And I'm like, "Are there a lot of people, like Microsoft employees with autism, on this autism listserv?" He's like, "No, that's all parents of kids with autism." So it's a good resource, you know, but it's. You know, it's it's interesting. Uh, you know, I, I think at a place like Microsoft, maybe it's sort of a, a known that there's a lot of autism there, but is there a big community around it? Is there, you know? So I don't know. I think we've got a ways to go still, even in, oh, yeah. you know. We still have the Seattle Chill. Oh, the Seattle Chill. Okay. Yeah. That. Yeah. <laughs> Well, two more questions here, and then probably my slides will be up. But isn't that interesting? Like when we talk about um, disability or autism, and then we intersect that with the cities or towns, and like what's and so in a small town, maybe there's less employment opportunity, but maybe the community, the, there's more groups, uh, you know, different entities. So, no, um, and then you'll go next. Okay. The college student who's reading your slides ahead, and I notice you have a quote from Michelle Garcia Winner. Yeah. Um, she's my homie. I mean, well, I mean, she she doesn't know me, but I, I respect her a lot. She's my idol. Okay, cool. I was lucky enough to get to present over at the conference. So I, um, so she was just saying Michelle Garcia Winner, who is a really neat provider, and her website. I've got it on one of the slides, but uh, Social Thinking. They have a lot of free articles, which is really nice, and um, pretty close perspective. Fair. Uh-huh. 
Right. So a smaller place, I think, can kind of like get understand that. And I'm going to talk a little about inclusion. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. So, um, so my name is Ben Wall. Um, I'm the program director for Aspiring Youth. And Aspiring Youth is part of Rither, which is a nonprofit. Rither is 125 years old, and there was a mother Rither. Really happy to say. Um, and these are some of our folks. We have a ropes course. So this is out on the challenge course. Um, Aspiring Youth has been around for 10 years. Um, we do social skills groups, individual coaching, and we have a pretty large summer program that goes age 8 to 18. In the last five years, I'm going to talk a lot about young adults, though. And I guess we can throw in older teens. We'll, we'll kind of go ahead and say 18 to 28. Um, we saw that we were teaching pretty good skills, and a lot of the folks were making great strides. And we, we're very lucky because we get to see these folks over the course of five or six years. Sometimes students will like be super busy during the school year and then you know they'll come to us just in the summers or sometimes they'll be with us throughout the year. Um, our groups go in 10 week cycles and we have everything from indoor rock climbing to Dungeons and Dragons to um, I mean Pokemon Go probably that's probably going to have to be the next one that we do. Um, our summer program we have um, girls art camp, girls yoga, and then we have our traditional camps, like, um, and the reason with um, our eight to nine and 10 year old girls were just doing a lot better kind of in their own space. We go co-ed at kind of like a, about age 11 or 12. Um, but in our main camps, we do a lot of trail building and habitat restoration. Um, and then everything else under the sun, we have a comedy improv or theater camp and video production and building and inventing for our Minecraft fans. Um, Again, we're through a nonprofit. We um, have uh, DDA community respite funding. Um, also, we're part of. Um, we get a lot of people th through FeetWa with Ben's Fund, which is a really incredible resource. So, uh, Feet of Washington, really incredible resource. Um, and we work with a range of young folks. I, th I think um, Seattle Children's Hospital has it a pretty good approach in saying steps to independence and lifelong learners. I think that's one of the best. Uh, ways to define our range that I've heard. Um, I think no one in the field, we kind of always, we hear high functioning, low functioning, we're just fighting and trying to define. But I think the steps to independence and lifelong learners is, is, is a good approach for sort of saying that. Um, in general, our folks um, would fall under that rubric of, of steps to independence. Um, what occurred was, you know, we were doing aspiring youth, we were working with school-age folks, and then 18 and 19-year-olds were saying, what the heck is out there? Um, and as Therese mentioned, there's been gains. There's, there's more out there. Um, some of the clients we worked with, we felt like were falling through the cracks a little, or where they were kind of going to community college and saying, go to the Disability Resource Center. And it's this building, and it says Disability Resource Center. Who the heck wants to start college by, like, stepping into that? Um, fortunately, I think um, there's places such as the Navigator program that sort of said, not only is this going to be here, but we're really going to liaison with you. We're really going to make sure and pull you in, um, or whether it's that program or, or you know, OLS in a lot of instances, things like that. So I think more and more we're getting it on how to kind of integrate these great folks and not just say, okay, you made it through high school, now you're on your own. And there's kind of this misconception in America that like, you hit 18 and you're independent. Um, in Europe, everyone lives with their family for a long time. So, you know, I think I've, I have noticed some of our parents feeling this pressure of like, well, you should just get independent. And I, I'm worried about how he's going to do in community college. I helped him with, high, with homework all through high school. But, you know, independent, he's 18. He's got to do it on his own. He's got to, um, what's the Silicon Valley term, fail forward? Well, you know, if you fail a lot as a 19-year-old, it's hard to fail forward, you know, and, and we're really not setting them up for success. So it's been nice to see more support. We've stepped in with a lot of the individual coaching for our young adults. I'm really happy to say we've, we've hired on a lot of our young adults. I and mean, that's the great thing about camp is if you're going to run a good camp, you hire your former counselors, okay? So we have many folks on the spectrum who work with us, um, and we're really proud about that. I, I don't have, like, a quota, but... Maybe businesses around the U.S. should have a quota and sort of say, we're going to hire these many people with, with disability, um, getting ahead of myself. But what we've learned by working with young adults 
um, first of all, is that there's some tendencies that create barriers. Um, Therese really covered some of the resources and that there's, there's more resources, but that there are still gaps and about how parents advocate. So I'm gonna review that a little. I'm gonna talk about that parent approach. And uh, when Therese and I were talking about this, is sort of like case manager kept coming up. And Therese has listed a lot of really good local resources. Um, I went to social work school, that's my training, so we hear a lot about self-care. So I'm gonna to talk to you about, if you're gonna be a parent case manager, how do you also take good care of yourself? How do you maintain good perspective? Um, we were lucky enough to have Gary Stoby come out to ride there recently and do a talk on, on um, young adults. I need to give a great talk. Two of the things that stuck out for me a lot was one is that the research has shown that case managers, the biggest factor for success, sort of like when they looked at all these other areas, a strong case management support was huge. And the reality is, is that in most instances, that was apparent. Um, and so that, you know, we're going to talk about how that parent approach is really important. The other cool fact he brought was that millennial women are the most accepting group in the population of folks with disability. So that's awesome. That tells us that there's changing perceptions out there and that um, folks we work with are not going to get those stares or those exclusionary type of feelings from the community at large. Do we still have a ways to go? Certainly. But when he said that, I, I got a little bit excited by that. And lastly, I'm going to talk about executive functioning skills because if we're talking about kind of some of the barriers, yes, there are some systemic barriers with services and accessing services and employment, um, but it's also sort of how does the person grow? Um, the brain doesn't stop growing at age 18, the, and it continues to grow for quite some time. And I hope that when I review executive functioning skills, we can talk a little about how, um, how to talk about it to a young adult and help them focus on not just the big picture, how to get independent or how to overcome these barriers, but instead to say how me as my individual person, how am I going to improve those skills? And fun thing about it too is as adults, we can also think like, okay, what's my executive functioning area? So we'll be reviewing that. Um, I should put this in quotes. It's my quote, so you can plagiarize it. Um, but it's true. I mean, um, sometimes when folks I work with, young folks encounter challenges They'll say, well, I don't want to do that, or it's stupid. Like if you're an adolescent or a young adult, it's a lot easier to say, well, that's dumb, or that's pointless, or well, I don't want to do that, than to say, I don't know how to do that, or that's really hard. Okay? So these folks want to have success. I, I, I mean, we have about 400 clients who come through our program a year. I can't think of any client where really deep down that person didn't want to be successful and happy in their life. But something is getting in the way. And it's not this goat. That's just so cute, I had to put it in there. So what is getting in the way? We're gonna talk about systemic barriers and then tendencies. Personal tendencies or traits that they have. Um, why did I put it in community exclusion first? Part of that is that whether it's at a school setting, whether it's kind of going to a store and getting a cold look or being, picking up that vibe that you are different, I don't care where you fall on the disability range, you pick up on that. And a lot of the young folks I work with, I don't think they'd be able to name it. I don't think they'd be able to say, wow, me and my mom went in the coffee shop and you know, I was stemming a little or kind of pacing or talked to the store owner about mine Minecraft for a really long time without letting him say anything. And he gave me a weird stare. They wouldn't be able to necessarily identify it, but they pick up on that. And so what I've seen occur is that sometimes they'll pull back or they'll get kind of anxious or they'll have experienced that and that becomes kind of this negative self-perpetuating cycle of they pull back a little and then they get less experience and then, um, and then they, with less experience they have less chance to practice it and then they may pull back some more. So as parents, one of the strategies I'm gonna say is keep trying, stay enthused. You may hear from your kid, well last time I went to that um, card shop, I was kind of getting weird looks. I really love Magic the Gathering, but you know, apparently I wasn't cool enough for that crowd and, and I was getting weird looks. I don't want to go back. And as a parent, I think one thing that you have to do is continue to nudge it. Okay, well that card stop shop stinks. We're never going back there. 
But I heard this one's a little bit more accepting. And maybe, you know, how to stack odds in their success. And keep trying. Um, because I think if there's exclusion, um, a young person gets less experience, less practice, um, and then it's harder. Okay. Um, second is poor access to services. And I think Therese covered that well of like, she mentioned that, you know, the employment goal can sometimes be like a few hours a month. And that leads me to my next one, which is low expectations. And if we are sort of saying, well, an individual with disability, they can get some community daytime, they can get some employment, but really, you know, we're not setting the bar high for them. Uh, a 21 year old, a 22 year old may respond to that. And sort of say, well, if you're not gonna nudge me and push me, then I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I, I'm, I'm picking up on that and I'm gonna fall into that, okay? Um, and there's a really cool book out. It's co-authored with Temple Grandin. It's called The Loving Push. And she is saying that as you parent, it's a parenting book. Um, but she's saying as you parent a, a young person with autism, they need that nudge. They need that push. It can't just sort of be like over accommodation. Okay. And so um, I think that so those are some of the barriers that we see with young adults. Is uh, These are three of the primary ones. Okay. Um, but it also comes from within a little. Okay, it's, it's, it's the traits and, and some of the traits that we see. First of all, hyper-focus can also be a real strength. And when applied well, creates excellent employees, <laughs> excellent students when, when applied well. I think the tricky thing is that in our society, we really have to multitask. I mean, think about your day or your role. It's probably not honing in on one specific task for eight hours straight and then you go home. You probably have to juggle a few things, okay? I will tell you I am great with email inboxes. I just, boom, 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 boom. I know exactly what to do. But if you have me do a project and kind of map it out longer, I have a little bit more difficulty there, okay? So I can relate to this. But hyper-focus also means that in social situations that can kind of be hard because we're supposed to be really fluid and nuanced and jump from different topics and know a little bit about this and a little bit about that and kind of be really fluid and ask the other person questions. And for some of the individuals we work with, that's a little harder, okay? There, um, so how, you know, we have to think about how that tendency to hyper-focus, we can turn into a strength and kind of situate it so the young person can have more success from that. Um, we need, obviously need to be, may, may name anxiety and other mental health issues, okay? Um, it's not the autism diagnosis or the disability diagnosis itself that, that always leads to challenges. It can sometimes be the accompanying emotional feelings and mental health feelings that surround this. Um, and I think I mentioned that around the community exclusion and the kind of the lack of experience that we sometimes see with our clients. Um, perspective taking, right? That a lot of the young folks I work with don't realize that the person at the coffee shop doesn't want to hear about Minecraft for, you know, like, Oh, or I see you wearing a Minecraft shirt. And the, you're kind of just supposed to say, like, yeah, Minecraft's pretty cool. Some of the clients I work with will then say, like, oh, yeah, Minecraft. Boom. And they're going to explain a lot of Minecraft. And they're not going to pick up that the other person's bored or uncomfortable or feel, feeling, you know. Um, we had one of our young interns, and she's doing a great job. But she's on the autism spectrum. And we were checking in with a parent at the end of the camp day. And I was kind of trying to silver line it a little. Like, okay, you're, you know, her son was struggling a little, and she would, the, my intern was kind of overdoing how much he was struggling and pushing it, and kind of like, yeah, he was really pretty upset for a while there, and so I was sort of like, well, but he did well at the end. I, was, I wasn't sugarcoating it, but I was trying to situate it in a way that was a little more positive, and her, her perspective taking was not such that she saw that the parent was gonna interpret that in a negative way. And stuff. So she got to learn a little bit about perspective taking. And by the way, it was no big news to the parent. The parents worked with us a while. They weren't shocked that he had a challenge with Pacific Science Center because it's pretty overstimulating. Um, but I was trying to reference how it was a lot better than the previous year. And um, this intern who is on the spectrum wasn't picking up on that quite. So that's the vignette about perspective taking. I mentioned lack of experience. And then hygiene and nutrition and wellness. I mean, if you have hyper focus and you're staying late up up late at night on the computer, you're not going to have good outcomes. You're going to, you're going to, a lot of the clients we work with don't have great sleep hygiene. They don't have a consistent sleep schedule and stuff. And 
and sometimes there's food aversions. And so from very early on, certain foods are avoided and that creates difficulty. One of the things that we see with a lot of our 19 and 20 year olds is that as kids and teenagers, they have this super high metabolism so they could eat pretty crappy food and play a lot of video games. And then, you know, you get to 19 or 20, not exactly middle aged, but you know, you're gonna, you know, the, I don't know. Because we'd have kids who just didn't eat very well, I could tell, but they were stick fit thin and just burn through the calories. But your metabolism slows a little when you hit 20 or 21. So I think there needs to be a lot of gains and growth on approaching the nutrition and health and wellness around this. There's a quote from Michelle Garcia Winner. Her website, I have it in the references, but it's socialthinking.com. And she has a lot of um, articles. And I'm really glad because she focuses a lot on young adults. And when I'm saying that I hire folks on the spectrum, that coming from a mental health agency, that was a little bit new for us. You don't necessarily hire former clients, except they're on a summer camp, so they're my former camp camper, so it worked. But when I heard her that she has people in her clinic who work for her who are on the spectrum and, and have disability, I, I said, let's do this and stuff. But she's just saying it's not that they're choosing to opt out. They're not, they're not choosing not to be social. It can look that way sometimes, but it's just how their brains process social information. And again, when we think about this for a kid, we're often thinking about friendships or classroom interactions. But when they get to being young adults, this, by the way, this is our trail building project in the summer. A lot of teenagers up on Snoqualmie Pass. Um, they work for Mountains to Sound Greenway um, and, and also parks, parks Department. So if you ever go to Ravenna Park right over here, that's a lot of um, uh, kids on the spectrum and with disability who've, who've built those trails. But, um, Social becomes really important around how to engage in new activities. It becomes important around employment. Um, when we've seen our young adults have employment challenges, it's rarely been about kind of lack of motivation to work. More often than not, it's been around difficult to ask for support or help. So um, I'm getting ahead of myself a little. Uh, difficulty on how to ask for support or clarify tasks. It's been kind of that perspective taking of maybe not having kind of work appropriate conversation or like um, maybe talking to coworkers a whole lot. And that again gets back to the community exclusion thing. If you're a young adult and you have a disability and work's your only place to socialize, you're not gonna focus on work tasks as much. This is exciting, you've been at home all week and finally you're at work and you get to work with your coworker. And the coworkers may be being friendly and at the beginning of the shift it's like, hey, how's it going? You know, what'd you do over the weekend? Our clients are excited to socialize and it can be hard to differentiate that. So that's, that's a biggie. And then we get into, Therese said something that was sad or shocking to me is that their services are bad with transportation, that access gets them to jobs late and they may get fired from that. I think that's, that's really unfair and unfortunate. Um, but it can also be around things around hygiene, kind of understanding what's appropriate for workplace settings in terms of hygiene. Um, but in general, the clients I've worked with have been pretty excited when they've gotten a job. And definitely this is not, when we've ex seen employment barriers, it hasn't been around motivation. They haven't been saying, uh, I don't care, whatever. Uh, they're excited and sometimes maybe a little too excited for the employment and kind of coming in with a little too much intensity. So as I mentioned, case manager is a big factor in success for young adults. Um, and you as the parent, you are the case manager. And so it's important is that you stay enthused and you stay connected with this. Um, finding your community, I think, is huge. I think that's one thing that's pretty hard is that when the parents are working at this through the school years, they can form an actual community with other parents at the school. There are special ed PTAs in schools. You get a community with the special ed teacher or the paraeducator. They kind of becomes a, 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 bit, a little bit of a network. And maybe you've got the OT involved as well and she's awesome and she's known your kid for a while or the, the speech and language pathologist. Or the There's a lot of supports and a lot of points of contact for community. And I think for parents of older teens and young adults, you've got to build your community a little more. And maybe it's, it's not through the disability community. Maybe it's just friends and friends of yours or family, but making sure that you really feel connected and supported, I think is huge. 
staying enthusiastic about it. I don't know if it helps to know that in Europe, most 20-somethings, even 30-somethings still live at home. Because one of the things I see is that the parents are working so hard at this, and then it's a double down factor of like, they're feeling like, well, I'm somehow deficient because my kid still lives at home. No. I mean, I think that's a, sort of a preconception that kid has to be independent at age 18, or kid has to move out right when they're 18. That may not be the case. Um, now, lower down is the loving push. At some point, they may need to take that step forward. Um, and you as parents can decide that. But I think it's very important that you are not making decisions based on what you think other people think. Okay? And, and, and I'm just speaking from the place of having talked to a lot of parents of 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 year olds. Um, but I think kind of being confident in what you've accomplished so far, I do think that you've gone a longer road and therefore you can either view that as like, man, I'm really burnt out and I'm done. Or you can say, well, I've gone a longer road, so I've learned more, and I have the strength to, 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 to take this on. Um, and I know I'm sounding a little cheerleadery when I say that, but I've met these incredible parents who have been able to accomplish that and kind of stay really involved and keep pushing and keep advocating, quite frankly, just continuing to be case managers. And the parents, what they're doing is they're creating empowering perceptions for their, I'm going to do questions at the end. Um, they're going to do um, empowering perceptions. They're going to create these for their young person, that the young person is capable, that they can contribute in meaningful ways. And that doesn't, I want to clarify, we, we start thinking when we talk about young adults, we think employment. But it's just not true. I mean, there are so many ways to contribute. And um, I don't think that employment should be the be-all, end-all. One interesting thing that I've often seen, there's a lot of ways to contribute to to the, to the culture, whether it's by being involved in the community, whether it's through creating craft or arts or music or being physically active or connecting with animals. These, all, these are all things that get you connected to others um, and that you're connected, okay? And that what they do, you know, that it influences what happens to me in my community, that it, it matters. Um, and I think employment's important but I also, I've, I've had a lot of parents come to me and sort of say, wow, we were trying so hard, finally got everything lined up, and he got a job, and it's kind of been a letdown. And, and now he won't do anything else. He's kind of like, in the morning before his shift, he doesn't want to be involved or kind of exercise or be walking or hanging out with friends because he's getting ready for a shift, and then afterwards he's really tired. And, and I'm not speaking against employment at all, but I think when we kind of put something on a pedestal as like, my, kid, my young adult's going to be independent once he gets a job, or my young adult's going to be happy once he gets this job. We're creating some unrealistic expectations, I think. So there's a lot of ways to be involved, whether it's through being involved active with community groups or interest groups or clubs, different social outlets. Um, I think animals are huge. Um, and, and it was really neat seeing the horse in your slide. I like that. Um, Wait a minute. What do you mean animals are huge? I think... I think we think of socializing just as with other humans, and I think getting involved in um, canine assisted therapy or minus one is capra assisted therapy. That's why it's the, it's the goat picture. We're doing goat therapy in our camp. I'm very excited. Having a dog, having, having bunnies, be, being involved with the animals, I think, can create some more co connections, especially if it's done in a way where it's like group based and kind of working with specialists who do that. And, and you know whether it's um, Little Bits is a really incredible program here, and there are many, many programs off that. Madison Grove Farm, Shoe Fly Farm. I mean, we're, we're fortunate there are a lot of ways to connect with, with animals and with nature. Um, parents can help create uh, empowering perceptions, OK? Um, so <laughs> there's an author named Daniel Siegel, and he talks a lot about mirror neurons, how young people pick up on your emotions. Um, and he's out of UCLA. And the folks I work with, they wouldn't be able to name it. They wouldn't be able to say mom or dad is in a really bad mood. And a lot of the parents come to me and they're like, I just wish you'd ask me about my work day for once. Um, so we get that. They wouldn't name it, but they can still pick up on that. And so one of the things that I think, and again, this is going to sound a little like cheerleadering, say stay enthused, stay involved. 
But I think it's not just for you. I think your 19 or 20 year old is going to pick up on that. And if they are saying, oh, I don't want to try that again. Last time I tried volunteering, it wasn't very fun. And you go with that. Well, first of all, you're defying Temple Grandin who says that this should be a loving push. You're saying, nope, let's try something new. So I think, you know, follow Temple Grandin. She's, she's pretty awesome. Um, and I think second, you're kind of allowing her to be low expectations and they're picking up on that. And so um, staying involved, finding new activities, trying new things and saying, yeah, the last volunteer at one did stink. They didn't communicate well with us. The tasks that they gave you were pretty boring. You didn't feel like there's a good team environment. We're going to learn from that and this next opportunity we find is going to be improved. Okay, so that's just something I'm suggesting. And again, to remember that you as the case manager, that's a very important factor. We're not just saying that as a, um, hey, be there for your kid. We're saying research has literally shown that case management's a huge factor here and you are your child's case manager. A DDA case manager is to manage resources. The client load they have means that they cannot be involved in a way where they're kind of moving things around and personalizing services. And I've seen DDA case managers go above and beyond um, or DVR, uh, you know, job coaches, et cetera. But there's certainly just a limit to that. And a parent is going to have at least some case management role. And I'm just asking you to embrace that. Okay. So just a few more slides here. So. I think one other parent strategy is bake, making these big goals into smaller components. Okay, a lot of times we say get a job or build independent living skills or become independent. Those are all big scary things to you and to your young person. Um, and I think that a lot of the goals that are formulated, one of the things we do with our young adult coaching program, and by the way, it's, I'm very happy to say we're moving it off the Aspiring Youth website because right now there's all these things about summer camp and social skills groups and then there's young adult coaching or young adult services. And I don't think that 22 year olds should have to navigate the rest of my site and see pictures of younger people. So it's gonna be DelphiYoungAdults.com. It'll be its own standalone website and that'll be up pretty soon. Um, but one of the things that our young adult coaches emphasize is smaller goals. If we're setting goals like get independent or um, get a job or master busing. These are six month, maybe year long goals. And it can be really hard to define that and track that and stay with it. I really would encourage in a lot of instances, parents to be thinking about three month increments. I mean, um, it's the way corporations do it quarterly, right? So really looking what, what can be accomplished in three years. And that leads towards these long term goals like improved employment skills, improved independent living skills. But rather than saying to a 22 year old, hey, I really want to help you get independent, we want to say, okay, we want to look at busing. That if you're going to be more involved in the community and having more work opportunities, we've got to master busing. And then we need to dial in even further of which bus routes, okay. And then we need to dial in further on what's the challenge? Is it getting to the bus route on time? Is it knowing which stop to get off at? Is it making sure to stay awake while on the bus so that you don't sleep through your stop? And again, we're kind of trying to drill down and get a little more specific on these skills because it can be different for a lot of folks. Um, and once that skill is, is gained, we're continuing to track it, but hopefully then moving on to others. Okay, we've gotten busing. We know that we're going to stay, you know, the, the big issue is that you tended to kind of get really into your video game and oftentimes you're missing your stop. Um, so you can play video games on phones now. Um, you missed your stop. We've got that figured out. Okay, great. Let's move on towards the next thing. Okay. Or social. It may be, how do I become social? Well, that can mean so many things. Is it that the young person needs to find more social outlets? Do they need to know how to interact socially when they get to those social outlets? Um, is it kind of around avoiding conflict and you know, handling tough situations in a social setting. Um, so we really have to drill down on those. And then I think another one is, you know, kind of when to, when to advocate and when to step back. I think in some instances it's important that you're in there and you're kind of working and kind of moving the needle and you're worried about how the community college is going, you're worried about how a workplace setting is going. And other times where it may be important to step back and have the young person kind of struggle and grapple with that a little. And maybe 
a way to step back is not just good luck, but saying, I need you to work on this with your job coach, or I need to work you to work on this with your therapist or your um, independent living skills coach. Okay, I mentioned building community. Obviously, you guys are the platinum parent club. Okay, Therese mentioned that she's a better parent person and provider because of what you've learned from your daughter. I, I, I'm, I feel like I'm a better person because I get to interact with these young folks. So like, I'm not in that platinum club, but I've seen the parents. Um, just know that you've got a great community and that late bloomers, that they can have just wonderful outcomes. And what you need to do is resist that, that push, that thing of like, get your kid independent quick or like, you know, the comparison, the rat race, so to speak. Um, and then again, I'm fighting against internalized oppression. What I mean there is that these young adults have slightly different paths, whether they are kind of on a path towards lifelong learner and kind of building skills there, whether it's college, whether it's employment. There's different parts of disability, and I think that sometimes we get a little bit fragmented. And I think parents don't realize how big the community is because they're maybe sort of really honed in on the issues that their own child faces. So I say to parents, there's slightly different paths, but we're kind of going in the same direction here. And, and an individual who has um, uh, you know, more profound disability may be encountering some really similar things as, as a person with ADHD or as a person with, with autism. And, it, and it's different paths, different experiences, but we have to kind of come together a little bit more as a community. It's a sudden nature. Um, and when I think about inclusion, I kind of think there's two parts. One is the community or the businesses or the places of employment saying, hey, w we want to accept, we want to reach out to people who don't look like what our norm is, who are different than us. And the other part is people who aren't kind of conformist, who don't adhere to that social norm, who, who have, maybe have disability or just different folks, that they're kind of understanding the things they need to do to adhere to the community, okay, kind of figuring out ways to kind of move forward with that, okay? So I think it's kind of a, a two-part. I think businesses and, and community settings have a ways to go. We were talking earlier about do small towns or big cities or, you know, different settings that are, who's more accepting? And I think all around, we've got a ways to go there. And, and disability has been called one of the last sort of civil rights frontiers. Um, because there are coffee shops, there are pla restaurants, there are places of employment where people are rejecting of an individual with disability and they would not necessarily reject other subgroups. That th but, but folks with disability have behaviors, have mannerisms that can feel off-putting to a person. Um, and we've got to train and educate those, those people at business settings, at community settings, so there is more in inclusion. Really quickly, I'm just going to take a few minutes here. The reason I include executive functioning, first of all, uh, it's the Republican National Convention tonight. Uh, Donald Trump has told me he's good on all six of these. He's, <laughs> he's dialed in, okay? But for the rest of us, we might still have some areas, you know. So I think that's kind of fun to look at just as parents, as adults, etc. But I like this because it's a way to talk about skill building to a young adult or an older teenager that isn't just diagnosis specific. Oh, you have autism, therefore this is the case. Um, instead, this is a way to sort of say, what traits do you have? What, what areas can you improve that's gonna lead to more success whether, success, whether in a high school setting, whether in a community college setting, whether in a work setting, whether in a social setting. I think it's also a way to kind of understand you know, um, how these things come up. Because it's not the diagnosis itself, it's kind of some of the ways that they process information. And uh, to me, these six areas are kind of the best buckets I've seen. And if I'm talking to an 18-year-old, I want to talk to him more specifically, not just, hey, you've got to work on your independent living skills. I want to help him dial down and understand himself a little more and help him maybe understand We've got great emotional control. You're kind of pretty easy going. You're, you, you know, you're, you're, you're not getting easily upset. You're a go with the flow type person. But man, when it comes to planning and prioritizing, man, like that's not happening. Your community college classes would be going so much better if you just kind of agreed to map out your daily assignments. 
A, a few of the young adults I've worked with seem to have some sort of allergic reaction to day planners. And then we try Google calendars and that's not quite working either and things like that. So plan and prioritizing for instance. But really quickly, I want to situate this. A lot of times executive functioning is more seen as like how to get children to do homework. And I want to situate this more as how young adults can build skills um, for social employment and other settings. Okay, and I'm going to take, I'm going to run through pretty quick. We had a little technical glitch earlier, so I'm, I'm going to go through this a little quicker than I would normally. But obviously, handling emotional emotional control is a hard one. And if I've been in work situations where I've been pretty upset, and somewhere along the line, I. You know, I, I guess I got to credit my parents, you know, whatever. Hi, mom. Hi, dad. Um, they taught me not to react. So I've had moments where I had a tough meeting or those emails where I wanted to write the email to a, call, a coworker in one way and I was very diplomatic instead. Um, that was me somewhere along the way. My parents would claim it's their doing, so good, good job, folks. But um, somewhere along the way I picked up, if I'm upset, I don't write that email. Or if I'm in that meeting, I find a way to be diplomatic about it, okay? Because um, I'm a passionate person, but I, I know how to handle that, okay? Um, some of the young folks I've worked with in a workplace setting, I know that this would be more challenging. Or even slight feedback, even a manager telling a 22-year-old, hey, could you do this a little different? They're going to internalize that a lot. They haven't learned how to take that feedback as much. And they're going to either have a really tough interaction with the manager or they're going to go home and be really upset around it. Okay? So emotional control is a biggie. And anxiety to me is either anticipation of interactions like, oh crap, this is going to be hard. Oh, this is going to be hard. Or it's afterwards a response to interactions. That didn't go well and I'm really upset and it kind of stays with them a lot. So kind of being able to let go. Okay? They say being a good quarterback in the NFL is about having a short memory. So I think that applies to other areas as well. Um, this is around impulse control. And we, we talk about kind of delaying gratification. Um, what comes up there, I think, in a lot of ways for me, what I've seen is this is around technology. This is around why go out and socialize when I have this great medium at home. And again, then that cycle happens. They don't socialize as much as would be ideal. They're not getting involved in the community. They're not getting as many chances to experience IRL, which means in real life, interactions. Um, it also means in work settings, listening to others. If you really want to get the word in edgewise, if impulse control is a challenging thing for you, it's going to be hard to listen to a coworker or listen to a customer, right? Um, delaying gratification, obviously, that also affects community college classes, right? And um, it's a little bit irksome to me when I hear a community college student say, I've got to play video games before I start homework. Okay. I kind of see that. Okay. Well, 30 minutes just to kind of ease back into getting home and then you're going to do homework or are we talking two hours, right? So that becomes the issue there. Um, flexibility, I think, is huge. Some of their peers are able to just kind of almost out of thin air understand what post high school looks like. I don't know it's because it's uh, older cousins or watching movies. They kind of just get a sense, it seems like, of, okay, this is what community college is like, or this is what's expected in this workplace setting. Okay? They can pick up on, their peers can pick up on like, oh, I can joke around with this manager, but I can't joke around with this manager. And so that goes back to kind of the way that um, there's a kind of um, inflexibility or cognitive inflexibility sometimes for our young clients. Um, and then, uh, of course, understanding others' perspectives. Um, well, I wouldn't be offended by that joke. I don't understand why the customer would. OK, <laughs> famous last words before you get fired. Um, there was a woman, she did a documentary about her younger brother who had a disability. And he was getting kind of a, uh, an internship, or a, I don't think it was employment, but kind of building towards employment. He loved, it was, it was a New York documentary. It was a few years ago. I'm blanking on the name of it. It was great. And he got um, a placement at a theater company working front desk. And it was a bad production. And he was telling the, the members of this theater, they were calling in, this was a bad production of The Music Man. I don't know. And he was like, I agree. I really think you should ask for a refund on your membership. <laughs> and things like that. 
And this poor guy, he thought he was just telling the truth. He thought he was being a really, because you, the interview showed, he thought he was being a wonderful employee. Like, in his mind, his inflexibility, his difficulty adapting didn't see, well, maybe being truthful here isn't the best thing. Maybe I've got to sort of uh, kind of go with, you know. And I think that's, again, about adapting, understanding different situations. His peer didn't need a step-by-step -step manual of, if a member complains, here's what you say. You would just know to say, oh, I'm sorry that you were disappointed with the show. Would you like to speak with my supervisor? Right? That's, that's kind of what you're supposed to say. Instead, he was just, yeah, I agree. It was awful. Lighting was off. The actors were terrible. He should, you should ask for a refund. You know? Um, and he was just being truthful. He, he was so surprised when his manager was upset with him about that. So it's very, I mean, and, and hopefully, and that's the biggie is like, can he learn from that? That would be the big question. And, and I guess that's part two of that documentary is like, was he able to apply that at a future employment place, right? Because if he was, then that's something he can kind of, a vignette he can go back and laugh about a little later. Um, I think flexibility is very difficult. Um, obviously, planning and prioritizing, I don't need to go into too much about that, but like, this gets into a lot of independent living skills of, are you getting ready on time? If, if the challenge is getting to community college class on time, getting assignments completed, um, you know, getting to places on time, getting, you know, be, being ready, having hygiene, it's often around planning and prioritizing, okay? Um, and some of it is kind of figuring out the non-essential, right? So if a person is, um, some of the high school students we work with, they same, spend the same amount of time as a, on a Spanish assignment that's worth like one one thousandth of their grade as their history assignment. It's, it's an assignment, so they're going to spend time on it. They're not saying, okay, all the other kids in my class are whipping through the Spanish worksheet because the history assignment's due tomorrow and it's huge, right? So they're not figuring out what's important and what's not. Same goes in a social setting as well. If you think about it, we, we don't just kind of list out everything when we talk. We kind of figure out what's most important and what is not. Okay, so that's what um, kind of filtering out the non-essential. Same with a work in place situation. That we, we would, in our work, figure out what's most important to the supervisor. Okay? If you're working at Fred Meyer and the most important thing is to make sure and label each item. You're doing inventory. Um, and oh yeah, by the way, can you also restock the paper towels? Um, their peers are understanding, well, I better do this because this is what my manager really cares about. A lot of the folks I work with are going to put equal weight to that, even though the second thing, through kind of an um, implied uh, statement by the manager, is less important. You know. And think about it. The manager might say, okay, make sure and label these. Not a single box can be without a label. And you know, if you get around to it, do, take care of the paper towels as well. Our folks are not kind of figuring out what the non-essential part is. Okay. Um, working memory, I, we're running a little short on time, so I won't get too into that. But essentially kind of knowing when to bring in information and apply it in different contexts. And I think social, that's very important as well. Um, and lastly, kind of self-monitoring, um, being aware of one's mood, um, being aware of how actions are interpreted by others. I mentioned earlier, understanding others' perspectives. Um, also having kind of, kind, of, kind of realistic goals for oneself, um, but really under, understanding oneself. And that's a big thing about um, becoming a young adult. It's not just gaining the skills, but it's understanding what skills you're good at. In my work, I know what tasks to avoid because I'm not very good at them. And I'm, I'm lucky that I'm able to delegate those to assistant director or other, others in my program. But part of my role is knowing what I'm good at and what not and kind of recognizing that. Okay? So this is that sixth area of executive functioning that I would want to mention. So that's, that brings us to the end of the slides. Thank you. Um, it's just rither.org is our website. I'm afraid I didn't put my email up here. but um, that's my mistake, uh, rather.org, you can find us on, on that website. So thank you very much. You bet. For Teresa and I. Any questions, folks?
Uh, Temple Grandin was, is able to explain her disability uh, to people. That, that is part of her success. And getting an autistic person to explain their strengths and, and weaknesses to people, to their employers and so on, is a, is a strength and an ability that will help them survive. Uh, Temple Grandin was employed, and she, but she had meaningful employment. Some of the problems that we have is that we, we get somebody employed in a job that they, be, after a year, they're completely bored. And it's more of a, it's more of a uh, drain on them than it's, than it's helping them. Uh, not to say they shouldn't work, but to have meaningful employment at the top of the ability that a person has uh, I think is really important. I think that goes back to what the person next to you said about how they go out and develop jobs that are are consistent with the person's interests. And ideally, I mean, just, just putting somebody into a job for job's sake is not good. None of us want to do that, um, disability or not. We don't want to be stuck in a, a job um, that others might perceive as meaningful, but if, if we ourselves don't perceive it as meaningful, it is going to be a drain. And so having, having the job developers that really look at person's strengths and interests and then go out and find those jobs, that's what we need to make people happy and successful in their jobs. Um, I want to get into this kind of field, and I'm having trouble trying to like get my foot in the door. And I was kind of wondering, would, do you have like any tips? Do you have any kind of pathway ideas? Because I'm kind of at a loss. <laughs> So the field meaning? Uh, um, so I want to kind of do what um, Michelle Garcia Winner is doing, but not be a speech language pathologist. And so teach social skills, but to the higher age range of the high school and college kids. Well, there you go. You can work for Ben. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, um, there, there's a lot of organizations. I'd love to chat afterwards, but um, you know, there, there are a lot. I mean, that goes back to luckily there are more entities, colleges, uh, different settings that are saying we've got to serve young adults. So thankfully I would say it's a, it's a growth area of the field. So we can chat afterwards. I can give you, um, between mine and, and others, there, there, there are a lot of people who are looking for support around this. Okay. Thank yeah. you. It's a good field to get into. Special care services is looking for people? Uh, there we go. Yeah, special care services, yeah. Are there um, any? One, um, I think got one more question up here. Well, why don't we just take a see if anybody from any of the oh, other sites great. have any questions? We'll just give them a second to ask a question. Um, Sounds like it. No questions. Oh, no questions. Okay, we've got we a question back, back here. All right. Yeah, Ben. Uh, what? Ooh. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Uh, uh, ben, uh, what? <laughs> she just presented this microphone. I don't know what. Yeah. Ben, what, uh, what? What? What should I take away from your presentation? What should I remember tomorrow morning? Well, I mean, my objective slide said, um, "What did I say?" Uh, tendency barriers. I wanted to talk about the barriers. Um, I want to talk about there are some tendencies that make it hard. Whether it's around perspective taking, whether it's around executive function areas that are challenging. Um, that the parent as a case manager is huge, okay? That that's very important and not to be downplayed. Um, I think one of the things I'm trying to approach it as is um, in the school population, it tends to be so smaller goals. There's sort of goals like your 11th grade year in school, there's certain things. And whether you're in a self-contained special ed classroom or honors, you're going to have those specific goals and your teacher is going to follow a curriculum. So it's very manageable for the young person to know what's expected of them and to kind of pursue goals throughout the month, throughout the year. 
And I think when we get to the young adult stage, a lot of times it's get independent, get a job, get a wife, or you know, just big, like these are the big goals, right? Um, get a husband, whatever it may be. Um, and I'm, I'm suggesting kind of breaking those large goals into smaller areas. Um, and lastly, I, I mentioned that the small goat was not the barrier to independence. So make sure that's important. I, if I can add to that, especially since, you know, what I'm going to remember from, from this talk, I think, tomorrow morning is, um, uh, you know, we, we do a lot to help teach our kids. We're trying to give them, you know, skills, and we're going to say, all right, we've got, we've got this deficit that we need to teach them skills so that they can um, a, adapt or adjust, you know, to our society. And one of the things that I think that um, I took from this is, you know, how do we uh, encourage society? How do we help our community be more accepting, be more welcoming of, of people who have differences? And I think that that last civil rights issue, when Ben said that, um, I think is incredibly true, you know, and, and, and how do we as a community uh, do a better job with including people who have disabilities? That's what I'm going to remember tomorrow. And he's got, he is an SLP, by the way. So. Yeah. Well, thank thank you, folks. Thank Appreciate you. you coming out. All right. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Thanks.